Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about David Damrosch's introduction to his book, What is World Literature? And I'm also going to say a few things about Lawrence Venuti's essay, How to Read a Translation. So let's begin with Damrosch. This is the introduction or a part of the introduction to his book, What is World Literature in 2003? And he poses it as a kind of provocative question. So some of the things that I was leading with in last week's video are things that Demrush is really going to try to work through the nitty gritty of. He begins at first on page 199 with saying that world literature is simply all or any literary work that circulates beyond its culture of origin. That seems fairly straightforward. But Demrush is going to go further to examine what must be in play in order for a work of literature to be able to circulate internationally. Because not all works of literature get to circulate, right? There, there are certain things, certain preconditions, if you will. And he says that in order for a work to even have the chance of moving beyond its borders, it needs to be recognized as literature, capital L, literature, by another part of the world. Thus, a work becomes, quote, world literature through what he calls a double process. It must be recognized as literature, that is, it must be considered worthy of attention of other parts of the world, and it must be allowed to circulate beyond its origins through the use of translation and publishing networks, which I'll say more about in a minute. Ultimately, Damrosch really develops his definition of world literature as a threefold definition, and this is listed on page 201. He says that one, world literature is an elliptical refraction of national literatures. I'll say more about that in a minute. Two, world literature gains in translation. It's interesting. A lot of times we talk about things being lost in translation, but something gaining in translation seems to be a precondition or necessary for it to be recognizable as world literature, according to Damrosch. And three, world literature is not a set canon of texts, right? It's not these books, these quote great books over here, but rather it is a mode of reading. A mode of reading that he defines as a form of detached engagement with worlds beyond our own time and place. So this is pretty interesting, uh, and this is something that we're going to really be returning to throughout the semester. So it's important that you understand what he means by a mode of reading. But let's go back to that first definition. When Damrosch calls for an ellip elliptical approach to understanding world literature, he's not using the word ellipse as in ellipses and, you know, as English majors, we say ellipse and we think grammar, right? Dot, dot, dot. He doesn't mean that. He actually means the image of like a geometric figure in which that figure is generated from two foci, like two points on the ellipses at once. So if you need to, you know, look up what a ellipse is according to geometry, that image of the two foci might be helpful. For Damrosch, using this metaphor of the ellipse, those foci are multiple in world lit as works come into contact with one another, come into conversation with one another. Thus, world literature is not a specific work. It's not just that book, say, The Odyssey, I keep returning to that as an example, um, or even, you know, Things Fall Apart, Chinua Achebe. It is not that book. It is the interaction between the texts and the readers and the processes that bring the text to readers, it is these multiple foci. Sorry, foci. Now, once a work becomes world literature, and this is interesting, Damrosch says its national origins seem to become less important over time. Essentially, the work becomes universalized. When we read texts from other parts of the world, we need to be careful about not imposing our own cultural assumptions on them, not imposing our own values. Certainly the conceptions of love and family, for example, that we have today in the United States are different from those that might have informed 11th century Japanese literature, like the tale of Genji. So we always need to be sort of attuned to when we are imposing ourselves on the text. Nevertheless, Damrosch says there seems to be common patterns in literature, perhaps even common archetypes, and those must be recognizable in order for a text to have cultural quote, relevance beyond its own culture, in order for it not just to be like an interesting cultural artifact from a distant time and place or a very different time and place, but rather for it to speak to readers from other parts of the world. So that tendency to recognize what we might call the human condition or a kind of universalism in world literature is always there, 
and we need to be both suspicious of it, but also perhaps quali qual I would say qualify it in a way or embracing it in a qualified way so that we aren't just uncritically saying, oh yes, this is universal work, but rather being aware that when we claim universality, that there's something always kind of at stake to what gets to be counted as universal. We don't want to just be in the world of vague universalisms, okay? We always want to be something um, somehow critical of that, while also recognizing that that's a part of what is going on when we talk about world literature. And he gives some interesting examples of this. Um, so I would give you, you know, tell you, go back and look at that. What are the different ways in which a work either speaks to what he calls the host culture, right, the text to which it is being translated, or doesn't? This is the part, actually, that I find the most interesting in Damrosh. It's when he says that works enter into a foreign culture in such a way that they are defined by the host culture's national tradition and the needs of that host culture in the present. Again, when I use the phrase host culture, this is coming from Damrosh, and he means the culture that is absorbing, reading a work from another part of the world. So in this class, we are the host culture for all of these texts that we are reading from other parts of the world. We are hosting them, <laughs> uh, you know, visiting with them, bringing them into our world. And I like this metaphor of the host because it allows us to kind of exist in a self-conscious, friendly relation to the text inviting it into our world without imposing ourselves on them. Nevertheless, there is always a negotiation between the two cultures, culture of origin and the host culture. And the host culture will in many ways dominate the culture of origin, not only in the way that the host culture brings its own cultural assumptions to the text, but also through the ways that a text makes it to the host culture. So let me give you some examples. When Damrosh talks about the needs of a host culture. We might think of the political needs. So for example, during the Cold War, there was a lot of attention paid to certain kinds of writers behind the Iron Curtain, certain modernist, critical, dissident writers in Eastern Europe and Russia and the Soviet Union. Those works were being translated into English and shared with American readers because they demonstrated that there was a lot of internal critique of the Soviet Union. Texts that were not being translated were texts that we might describe as socialist realism or texts that supported the Soviet Union because those texts did not serve the political interests and needs of the United States at that time. Okay, so translation is always political. Circulation is always political. The present needs of a culture might shape what kinds of texts come to us. Okay, let's get back to, if you want to look at the bottom of page 201, there's a more thorough discussion of the different ways the host culture can use a foreign work. I want to say something about his distinction between specialist and generalist. Now, when reading a work of world literature, we can't just ignore the specialized knowledge of the original culture. We can't say it doesn't matter what culture our work is from. We will miss a lot. At the same time, it's impossible for us to be linguistic and cultural specialists of every work that, that we might pick up, right? Um, and certainly, I'm not asking that of you in this class. So then we need to think about what is it that we are doing? What do we bring to the study of world literature as generalists rather than as specialists of a particular part of the world? We can rely on specialists when we read, say, Introduction to the Epic of Gilgamesh. We can learn a lot about the original context of Epic of Gilgamesh, of ancient Mesopotamian culture and religious practices, etc. That can be helpful. But ultimately, we are not reading it for that information. We are reading it as a generalist in another way. The generalist has a kind of freedom the freedom of someone who can make connections and put works in conversation with each other that the specialists would not be interested in, right? The specialist is just interested in ancient Mesopotamia culture. We, however, get to think about the Epic of Gilgamesh alongside the Odyssey, alongside the Arabian Nights, alongside 
Kafka's metamorphosis, if you want, right? We get to do that work of putting text in conversation with each other and finding these moments that really speak beyond the particular culture. So think about that. You know, at the bottom of 203, or it's 202 really, um, Damrosh discusses what the generalist does better than the specialist. And think about how that might inform your reading of these texts, because it can be a place of strength, so long as we recognize what it is we as generalists do and don't do, okay? Now, one of the other points that Damrosh makes, one of the major three definitions, is that a work of world literature gains something in translation. Well, what does he mean by that? This is something that's going to be taken up quite a bit in Venuti as well. So it might start to become clearer when you read that piece. But he means that a text in translation is not, um, we don't miss out on so much that it becomes worthless to read it. Right? Some texts are considered untranslatable, quote unquote. Like you could put it in English or another language, but you would miss so much of the original, so many you know, references or allusions or connotations that it's, not, it's just not worth it. You miss too much. Moreover, you have texts that don't really gain anything in translation um, insofar as they're not literary. So when Damrosh talks about certain technical manuals or legal language, Yes, you can put it in one language or another, but it doesn't add anything to it. It's just mostly just being transcribed, communicated in another language. When a work is translated into another language, it takes on all of the cultural connotations and meanings in the particular words of that new language. It gains a literary quality that might be similar to, but different from that of the original. Again, Venuti's gonna develop this idea, but just hold on to that, okay? And we need to keep in mind that a translated work is always a work of collaboration with others. The translator, the publisher, etc. A work of world literature is never coming at us directly. It is heavily mediated. And by the time it gets to us, it is essentially what Walter Benjamin, literary critic Walter Benjamin referred to as in its afterlife. That means that, again, as a generalist, the reader can read it in relative freedom from the original context. But a good reader of world literature, a cognizant, thoughtful reader of world literature, always recognizes that they are dealing with a mediated text, always recognizes that they are reading a translation, not the original. Okay, now to the final definition that Damrush offers. World literature is not a canon of texts, but a mode of reading. In that sense, it's all of what I've said just now. It's all of it, what he's talking about in these other two definitions. But here he's really drawing attention to the fact that if it is not a specific group of texts, then world literature is what we do. Anything can be a work of world literature, really. We don't have to um, read, it doesn't have to just be extensive. You know, can't be all the works in the world. World literature as a particular kind of study can take place between just a small group of texts. One can quote, do world literature with two books, right? Insofar as it is a matter of how we think about those works relating to each other. World literature, he says, takes place in the mind of the author who draws directly on the influence of other works of literature. So we might think, for example, in this class, we'll be talking about the way the Odyssey influences the Arabian Nights, specifically Sinbad the Sailor. So these texts you know, are in conversation with each other through indirect ways, perhaps, through certain trade routes, um, and also through translation into French. And it's, it's a very interesting dynamic. Another way to think about the conversations between texts is the conversation that takes place in the mind of the readers who put the work, the different works of world literature in conversation with each other to form kind of unique constellations, if you will. So for example, one could read the Odyssey and then one could read a work like Heart of Darkness and compare the representations of voyages and returns and representations of the other 
representations of imperialism. And doing that work is also the work of world literature, works from different times and places that have no direct connection to each other, but in the mind of the reader, we are sort of worlding these texts. Finally, Damrosch calls for distance when reading world literature, and that is that kind of critical distance that helps us appreciate the way a work reaches out beyond its culture of origin, but also importantly encourages us as readers to take critical distance from our own culture. So to you know, not just accept our own kind of cultural assumptions that we bring to a text, but to be just kind of constantly self-aware and meta-critical, if you will. Almost a, a paranoid reader, <laughs> but hopefully that brings a kind of enjoyment as well. Okay, just a few things from Lawrence Venuti's How to Read a Translation. I think this text is fairly straightforward and he gives us some really good ways to think about translation. And again, hopefully it makes you a little bit paranoid, <laughs> productively paranoid when you pick up a translation. He says three main things on page one and page two. First thing is that the translator essentially rewrites a text, okay, to a, not just rewriting it, the, the rewriting happens in order to appeal to the culture that it is being translated into. So really reshaping and thinking about the target culture or the host culture. Um, so the translator is always aware of that target, right? Now he also says that when we, or when the translator changes the word of the text in the translation, which obviously one does, certain resonances, allusions, connotations of words in the original language are lost. And this is especially obvious in poetry. And those of you who are creative writers, and especially those of you who are poets, think about how would you feel if your poetry was being translated into another language when you have spent a long time picking that precise word in English, and now this word is going to be lost. But it's not just lost, right? Because when a work is translated or when a word is changed to another word in another language, it takes on other resonances, other allusions, other connotations that emerge in the translated text. And rather than that being a problem, that's the kind of thing that Damrosh is talking about when he says that the text gains in translation. It gains this new layer of meaning. And that's just as valuable. It's not wrong, it's not false. It's a different layer of meaning. He also says that often the assumed goal of a translation is to make the text readable to the reader so that it doesn't read like a translation. So someone might say, oh, I didn't even realize this was translated. It's so smooth, it seems so natural in English. But Venuti cautions us and says that that's not necessarily always a good thing. Sometimes being fooled into thinking that we're just reading a text that wasn't translated, a text that was originally written in English, can, um, you know, force us to forget that we're reading a translation, that we're reading a text that is mediated, and doesn't allow us to become critical of the assumptions we're imposing on the text. So think about that. You know, if you have a preference for really smooth translations or for translations that don't include footnotes, for translations that allow you to pretend you're reading in English, well, why is that? I mean, you are reading in English, but reading in English original. You know, why do we want that kind of smoothness? Um, what, what do we lose from not being aware all the time that we are engaging in a translation? He offers us five rules for reading a translation, and these are rules that I want you to especially take into the reading for today, Bayes Dow's poem, The Answer, or Answer. So here are the five rules says on page two, don't just read for meaning, be aware of form. The translator's choice in terms of style, tone, certain phrasings, certain poetic forms, changing the poetic structure of a poem, for example. Be aware of those aspects of it. Number two, he says, don't expect translations to be written in current standard dialect. The translator may need to use a non-standard dialect to render something about the original, and he gives some very interesting um, examples of this. So I want you to keep this in mind when we are reading the Odyssey, when there are moments of kind of idiomatic expressions or colloquialisms in the particular translation that we're reading, and what is the effect of that? This is kind of connecting to number three as well. Don't overlook connotations of words in translation. 
cultural references to the host culture that the translator might bring up are kind of interesting moments that attempt to make the text relevant to us or kind of make us feel at home in the translation. But sometimes they can also be a little cheesy. Again, we're going to see this in the Odyssey, um, in Fagel's translation, where he tries to make it accessible, but um, it's, it's always in these moments of accessibility that we almost kind of stop, stop and think, wait, did, did Odysseus really say that? Um, and, and those are productive moments for us as readers of world literature. Lanuti encourages you to read the translator's prefaces before you read the beginning of a translated work, before, sorry, before you begin translation, translated work. I encourage you to do the same. Uh, this will give you a kind of a framework for understanding how the translator thinks about the work of translation, how the translator approached this particular work, what sort of problems the translator came across as they were translating it. And these things are all very helpful in guiding our reading of the text that's been translated. Number five, the fifth rule, he says, importantly, don't take one translation of one text as representative of an entire foreign literature or culture. And this is true also of just any given book. Right? You can't say, oh, I've read Salman Rushdie, or I've read you know, Arundhati Roy's God of Small Things, I know everything about India and Indian literature. That's absurd. You wouldn't say the same thing about the United States because you've read Beloved, right? <laughs> you, you have to kind of remind yourself all the time that just because you read one text, one translation doesn't mean you become an expert on that part of the world. In the final paragraph, of Venuti's essay, he says that reading translations is an act of resistance because so few works make it into translation. Because essentially, publishers think you, that US readers aren't interested in the rest of the world. And frankly, translation is a lot of work, right? You have to pay someone to do the work of translating. Um, and some pieces, you have to get the rights to work in the other language. Uh, and then you have to market it, you have to convince someone to read the latest French novel or, um, forbid, you know, a, a quote, minor language. If you want to read the latest novel from part of the world that you might not think about very often, you know, what's happening in Algerian literature? I, I don't know. But publishers don't want to take that gamble. And so they really don't give us access to very many books. Roughly, you know, 3% of books published in a given year in the United States are books that were translated into English. So we're really missing out on what's going on in the rest of the world in terms of literature. So Venuti says, every time one insists on reading a work in translation, it is an act of resistance that recognizes that this status quo of unequal exchange between cultures, between literary cultures, is not only less than ideal, but also deeply well, oppressive and problematic and reproduces all kinds of geopolitical dominance of the United States, etc. So that through reading literature, we become connected to a broader kind of political cosmopolitan sensibility as a sensibility against the resistance of you know, pr the provincialism, sorry, the resistance to provincialism um, that he wants to kind of suggest reading can offer us. Okay, those are my, my comments on Damrosh and Manuti. I'll be posting the notes that I've written about these two texts, and then I'm going to make a short video about the Dao's Okay, thank you so much. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the discussion board posts.